When you think of speedrunning, you probably don't think of pausing the game. After all, it's hard to beat a game without playing. As it turns out though, menus are among the most consistently broken features in speedrunning. Whether it's physics breaking launches, momentum preserving boosts, or even stopping time itself, menus introduce unique means of breaking games for speedrunners to take advantage of. Menus play a key role in speedrunning the original Ratchet & Clank game. This is nowhere more apparent than in the New Game Plus category. After the player beats the game, they're prompted with the option to either warp back to before the final boss fight or to start a new profile that retains their weapons and bolts. By starting a new profile, the player now has access to the goodies menu as well. The goodies menu contains extra features like skill points, cheats, and most importantly, in-level movies. The impact of this menu is seen within seconds of starting a new game plus run. Runners begin by performing a Walloper Punch. The Walloper is a melee weapon that pushes Ratchet when he attacks. By opening the goodies menu and playing an in-level movie, the runner cancels the Walloper's animation, putting Ratchet back into an actionable state but preserving the momentum. This allows him to start a movement chain to maintain his elevated speed. This is best demonstrated on Veldin, the opening planet of the game. The level can be completed in under 20 seconds with two Walloper Punches being used to cross otherwise chasmous jumps. Another essential part of Ratchet & Clank speedrunning is the Personal Delivery Assistant, or PDA. The PDA is a portable vendor where the player can purchase additional ammo from anywhere at a significant markup. While its base function isn't particularly useful, the state it puts Ratchet in is. By holding down the L1 button, Ratchet goes into first person cam. When this is done while opening the PDA, Ratchet enters into first person when the PDA closes. This is significant since the first person camera functions as a grounded state, allowing Ratchet to use grounded moves opening up a world of possibilities. The most basic of these is infinite jumping. Since Ratchet is in a grounded state, he's able to swing his wrench, providing Ratchet with a jump. By continuing to open and close the PDA, this can be chained infinitely in most situations, allowing Ratchet to cross distances of nearly any size. Additionally, Ratchet can side flip out of the PDA. This can be used to quickly gain height and is used at several points throughout the run. This is just where it begins though. Two upgrades that Clink receives over the course of the game, the Heli Pack and the Thruster Pack, greatly increase the movement options available to Ratchet. Both can be used in addition with infinite jumping, allowing for more height gained or distance covered. The PDA is also capable of preserving momentum. This is an especially useful complementary component when doing neutral long jumps. With the use of the Heli Pack, Ratchet is able to perform a long jump. By releasing the analog stick back to neutral and continuing to long jump, Ratchet will gradually gain speed. The downside is that the long jump has a limited range of movement, making it possible to be off course or have poor jump spacing. This is where PDA stops come into play. By opening the PDA, the player can stop mid long jump but retain the speed they've built up. In the case of a poor angle, the PDA can be used to convert the long jump into a glide, providing a much more ample range of motion than long jumping. Combined, these allow for an increasingly fluid movement chain, as it's possible to readjust in an instant. Since the PDA conserves momentum and each long jump adds extra speed, a tech known as speedias can be used to build up speed in a tight space. By doing a long jump, then immediately opening the PDA, Ratchet will begin building up speed without moving too far forward. By repeating this, it's possible to reach high speeds without a long runway to do so. An excellent example of how game breaking the PDA and the menu are can be seen on a second trip to Orkson. Here, Ratchet must chase an infobot to 7 locations across the level. Rather than being able to skip directly to the end, Ratchet must pass through several triggers to progress the infobot forward. This requires a very specific route to be followed. The level begins with a walloper punch into a neutral long jump. Since the second jump is quite long, a PDA stop is used for proper jump spacing. The PDA glide is then used to veer to the left, with several more PDA stops and glides being used before Ratchet lands. Ratchet then changes to the thruster pack and PDA side flips over a rock wall before entering into a building and performing a chain of them up to the infobot. To underline just how important the menus are to Ratchet & Clank speedrunning, Orkson 2 is around a 69 second level. Either the menu or the PDA is opened 26 times during that span. Another PS2 era game that's broken due to menus is SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom. In BFBB, there exists a glitch known as Cruise Boosting. By activating the Bubble Bowl and the Cruise Bubble on the same frame, both abilities initiate. In instances where the Cruise Bubble takes precedence over the bowl, the forward momentum of the bowl is captured, creating a force that constantly pushes SpongeBob forward and increasing his speed. While the benefit to moving faster is clear, Cruise Boosting also has another, less obvious advantage. When a Cruise Bubble is activated, SpongeBob's model switches to one firing a rocket. On the first frame of this switch, SpongeBob becomes intangible. 
Normally, this doesn't matter, as Spongebob is stationary and doesn't fall fast enough to go through the ground. When he has a cruise boost though, not only is he moving forward, but this forward movement cancels the cruise bubble animation early, allowing him to repeatedly activate it for more frames of intangibility. This all is great for clipping through walls, but clipping through the ground adds another layer. While cruise boosting cancelling the cruise bubble's animation is still useful, the more beneficial component is less clear. In normal gameplay, Spongebob's down momentum is reset when he lands on the ground. The exception to this is when he bowls. If he falls off a ledge while bowling, this down momentum will be preserved for the duration of the bowl. Since cruise boosting interrupts the bowl, the bowl never technically ends, causing the down momentum from falling to be stored indefinitely. This functions as a constant downward force being pushed upon Spongebob. Even still though, this isn't enough to clip through the ground. Fortunately, this is where pausing the game becomes useful. A pretty insignificant detail for most games is how quickly the pause menu opens. While some games have full animations that need to be played before the menu opens or closes, BFBB is the opposite. The menu opens and closes in a single frame. Normally, this wouldn't matter, but in the case of BFBB, the menu has different background music than the rest of the game. Since the game is switching music tracks every frame, it creates significant lag. When done correctly, this lag can be used to functionally extend Spongebob's intangibility window, which, when combined with down momentum, allows him to clip through the floor. This was useful in several parts of the game. In Jellyfish Fields, the spatula Drain the Lake requires Patrick to pick up and throw robots at 5 goo pumps. This was slow not only because Patrick is slower than Spongebob while cruise boosting, but also the time required for the robots to spawn is significant. By lag clipping through the arena's floor, Spongebob is able to navigate up to the spatula without draining the lake. The other most important lag clip occurred in Rock Bottom. At the very beginning of the level, Mrs. Puff tasks Spongebob with retrieving six paintings that have been stolen from the museum. These paintings are spread out through the three sub-levels that make up Rock Bottom. Some of the paintings are right along the path, making it insignificant to collect or ignore them, but a few require a significant detour to reach. The developers of the game were well aware of this fact, so rather than having to collect them all manually, they added a trigger in the form of a shiny object. When this shiny object is collected, it sets the task flags to complete, allowing the player to talk to Mrs. Puff and obtain the golden spatula. Shortcuts like these are common during game development, but less frequently see their way into the final mix. Rather than remove the trigger though, the developers placed it where they thought no one could reach it, right under Mrs. Puff. For the most part, this spot was completely inconspicuous. Only by jumping off this side of the map and peering through a crack in the wall could someone see the shiny object. Even with the cruise boost, it remained far outside anyone's grasp though. But by lag clipping, the player is able to reach it. To underline how close the shiny object was while remaining out of reach, it's possible to lag clip and collect it, then talk to Mrs. Puff again, teleporting the player back above ground. In the end though, the community made a decision that left lag clips obsolete. Due to the inconsistency with which the game lagged, and an improved understanding of how Xbox hardware function, the community opted to move away from using game discs and to instead download BFAB directly to the Xbox's hard drive. This had the benefit of improving load speed, but at the cost of lag clips. Since the game no longer needed to read the disc to change songs, mashing the pause button did not create sufficient lag to clip through the floor. Some menu glitches even persist between multiple games in a series. The PC port of the first and second Harry Potter games use very similar game engines, allowing glitches on one to frequently be applicable to the other. The primary glitch shared between the two games is known as brightness boosting. Within the game's menu is a set of sliders used to change settings. The most important of these is for brightness. When Harry is in a ledge grab animation or being damaged in HP1, it's possible to pause the game and use the brightness slider. While this doesn't change the game's brightness, it instead launches Harry into the air. Normally, this would only launch Harry one unit into the air since the game is not constantly updating while the menu is open, but instead once the player closes it. By binding a key to reload the game and pressing it while in the menu though, the game begins running in the background while the menu stays open. This allows the player to move the slider as much as they want, with the amount Harry is boosted being proportional to the number of times the slider is moved. This tech can only be performed while Harry is actively in a ledge grab animation, but it isn't as straightforward as it seems. Harry actually has three different animations when grabbing a ledge, depending on how close he was to making it up. Although each will move Harry upwards, brightness boosting reacts differently depending on which of these animations he's in. If he gets a short ledge grab, he will initially move backwards before moving forwards. For a medium length animation, Harry moves to the right and forward, and a long animation simply moves him upwards. This allows Harry to immediately skip to the end of missions, such as Spongify due to it being largely vertical. Even in levels that cannot be completely skipped, brightness boosting frequently allows the large portions to be bypassed. That isn't the only way menus break Chamber of Secrets. 
Normally when Harry casts a spell, there's a period of time before he's able to cast another. By pausing after a spell is cast, the animation is interrupted and Harry is able to immediately cast again when unpaused. Perhaps the most broken use of menus though is Quidditch Warping. Located next to the Quidditch Stadium is a board that allows Harry to play one of six Quidditch matches. A similar menu is accessible at any time from the pause menu, but without the ability to start a match. By opening the Quidditch menu and pressing F4, all the menus will be instantly closed. If the map is open and then closed, it will take the player back to the Quidditch menu, but now a match can be started from anywhere. If this is done while in a level, Harry will be warped to the stadium and after being violently beaten, the game would read the level as complete and let Harry progress. The menu can even be used to expedite Harry's bludgeoning. The CPU of the other house's seeker increases in difficulty as the matches progress, with match 6 against Slytherin featuring an extremely aggressive Draco that quickly pummels Harry into soft tissue. During the first cutscene, if the menu is reopened and a different match is selected, the seeker will have the strength of that new match. By selecting match 6, Harry can quickly be clobbered before continuing on to the next level. While the story of menus in other games is one of being broken, in the case of The World Is Not Enough, it's one of being killed. The World Is Not Enough is a Nintendo 64 game based on the 1999 James Bond film, whereas the N64's other James Bond game, GoldenEye, is among the most popular and storied speed games of all time, Twine is the near polar opposite. Over the course of the game's life, it's never been viewed as a serious speedrun in the way GoldenEye or Rare's other FPS title Perfect Dark was. Members of the Elite community would occasionally experiment with speedrunning the game, but not for very long and hardly seriously. A quick look for the now defunct leaderboard for the game makes it clear what people thought of it. One of the few exceptions to this was a runner by the name of Brandon Sanford, or Bix. Back in the mid 2000s, Bix was a high level GoldenEye runner, who, when active, could crack the top 10 rankings of the best players in the world. He'd go on to play Twine for a period, ranking as high as second behind only Brian Bosshart. Bosshart was also the top ranked player in both Goldeneye and Perfect Dark, showcasing his dominance at the time. To fully understand this story, it's necessary to explain how mid 2000s speedrunning communities worked. Video caption equipment such as capture cards were not widely available at this point. Instead, speedrunners would rely on either camcorder, which produced middling capture quality at best, or a VCR to record gameplay to a VHS. This allowed for a higher quality run to be recorded, but presented the obvious question of how you get this onto this. For most people, they didn't have a way to get their times online, but a few members of the elite community did. It became commonplace for runners to send their VHS tapes to these people, who would go on to upload them to the internet. This obviously required a huge amount of trust, as it was entirely possible that the tape and any evidence of the times you achieved would be lost. For a number of years, this is exactly what appeared to have happened to Brandon Sanford. Bix would send tapes of his to a runner named the Mouser Scribe in the mid-2000s. The tapes had a variety of games and times on them, including the runs of the level Cold Reception that he claimed were around 2 minutes 8 seconds, but those videos were an hour and a half long due to a new strat he was using. This was impressive, as the record at the time was a 2.17, and even today, the time stands at a 2.16. Unfortunately, these runs would never find their way to the internet. For years, the person Brandon had sent his tapes to failed to upload them. Nearly a decade later after being sent the tapes, and 5 years after the last time he sent a message, Mouser would return to the Elite forums after seeing Goldeneye being ran at AGDQ 2014. He would go on to reveal that he struggled with anger issues, and one day he couldn't handle it. He would destroy virtually everything in his room, including tapes sent to him by members of the community. Too ashamed to tell anyone, he would hide the truth for the next several years. Miraculously though, Brandon's tapes survived. Mouser would spend a month capturing and editing the tapes before uploading them as a magnet link to the forums. Several members of the community would download the files, only for the cold reception runs to still be missing. So what was the magical strat that saved 8 seconds? In Twine, if the player unpauses and repauses the game, Bond's position will progress 1 frame of distance. The in-game timer does not begin counting again until the second frame after unpausing. Since these communities use the in-game timer for record keeping, this creates a very obvious problem. On most levels, this isn't incredibly worth it. While Bond's position updates on this frame, he isn't receiving any movement input. This means that he's slowing down slightly each pause, and that eventually the player will need to remain unpaused for a bit to reach top speed again. The exception to this is the level Cold Reception. Cold Reception is a skiing level. Rather than needing to reobtain his max speed every so often, Bond is continually moving forward on his own. This makes it so that if a player were to frame perfectly pause each time, they'd be able to get a time of 0, 0, 0 since the game always rounds down to the nearest second. This pause abuse creates such a miserable gameplay experience that the runners that do exist for the game explicitly ban the use of it. 
This isn't to say that pause buffering makes for a bad speedrun though. For some games, it's a large part of what makes it playable. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is one of speedrunning's most impressive and storied games. Released back in 1998, game-breaking tricks continue to be discovered frequently, providing a depth of technical options few games can match. With all this tech though, it was bound for some of it to be difficult. With several frame-perfect run-killing tricks through an over 3-hour run, the potential existed for OOT to be simply too difficult to be a good speedrun. Luckily though, Ocarina of Time had an answer for this as well. The game has an animation for the menu opening and closing. During the last bit of the closing animation, the player is able to press a button and have the game perform the input on the first frame after unpausing. With proper pause timing, this can be used to advance the game frame by frame, allowing tricks to be buffered rather than relying on raw precision each time. One of the most evident examples of the benefits of pause buffering is the glitchless Gerudo Fortress gate skip. In order to reach the haunted wasteland as Child Link, the player must first get past this gate. The trick involves throwing a bomb at a very precise angle and location, and then side hopping off the ledge. If timed correctly, the bomb will explode, hitting Link over the gate. While this doesn't sound too difficult, it would require approximately 11 frame-perfect inputs in the span of 3 seconds. Over the course of the trick, there are only a handful of frames where you don't need to be doing something perfectly, and instead have a window of time to perform them in. Since the setup is so precise, holding the analog stick in any direction for even a frame too long will cause the trick to fail. Despite being known for years, no one has ever pulled off this trick without pause buffering. As one would expect when it comes to OT though, pause buffering isn't the only way menus break the game. The game's menu is made up of several screens that players can cycle through. One of these screens features the items Link can use throughout the game. Since Ocarina of Time has both child and adult Link, there are items that one can use that the other cannot, meaning that some areas and puzzles require a specific Link to be completed. Being able to perform an action intended for one Link with the other opens up a world of possibilities while reducing the need to backtrack to areas. These items still appear in the menu, but are shown in a grayed out state. Luckily, this can be achieved. By highlighting the item you wish to equip and cycling over to another page in the menu and then coming back, the item that was highlighted remains indicated. By scrolling over to an adjacent item that Link can equip and selecting it on the first frame possible, the game will equip the item Link originally had highlighted. This is because the game is reading the equipability of the new selected item as valid, but failing to update the item it's supposed to equip, causing it to give Link the initial item. Of course, OOT allows for more than just simple tricks to be performed using menus. Stale Reference Manipulation, or SRM, is a trick that allows the player to write code for the game to read. The game keeps track of the position and data of items. This includes data related to items Link is holding. Even when the item Link is holding is deloaded though, it will continue to try to write data regarding the rotation of that item. The only issue is that the area where it's trying to write the data is no longer related to the item being held, causing Link to be corrupting the data elsewhere. This can be used to tell the game to check for code, but it will no longer be looking in the right place. By manipulating the data where the game is going to look to resemble code, the game can successfully interpret it as such. Setting up values in-game can be restrictive though. This is where the menu comes into play. Ocarina of Time's main menu allows the player to input a file name. By creating a file with a specific name, and then making the game read this file name as code it must execute, it's possible to get the game to do nearly anything. This includes warping to the final cutscene without leaving Kukiri Forest. Before the discovery of SRM, the N% world record was a 1658 set by Torch and considered incredibly optimized. In the years since, it's come down to under 4 minutes. Beyond this, most categories have been split between versions allowing SRM and banning it. In a game defined by constant innovation and broken glitches, SRM may be the biggest, and the menu plays a critical role in its utility. Perhaps the most broken menu in all of speedrunning though is from Banjo-Kazooie. Originally released on the N64 by Rare, Banjo received an Xbox port after the studio was acquired by Microsoft. While many tricks are shared between versions, the Xbox features a unique and groundbreaking exploit that completely revolutionizes the game. For the longest time, Banjo's speedrunning was limited by a single obstacle. Throughout the game there are 12 note doors, requiring the player to collect an increasing amount of musical notes to enter. Each world contains 100 notes, for a total of 900. While most gates can be bypassed without the required number, the 8th door cannot. Instead, the player must collect the requisite 810 notes that it demands. This means that the route would have to collect 90% of all the notes throughout the game, taking Banjo and Kazooie into each level and exploring most of them. All of this changed early in 2023 though, with the discovery of Pause Overlap Glitch. By pulling up the Xbox menu during some cutscenes, the game is paused, opening the game's menu and allowing the player to gain control of Banjo during the cutscene. 
This completely breaks basically everything in unexpected ways, with some objects in the game even adopting Banjo's properties and copying his moves. The more important aspect from a speedrunning perspective though is note cloning. But in order to understand note cloning, it's necessary to first cover cutscene warping. Throughout the game, there are several pairs of cauldrons that function as warp points. When the player activates both ends of a pair, a cutscene will play. Normally when a cutscene plays, Banjo will not show up in it, but if Banjo jumps into the cauldron before the cutscene begins playing, Banjo will load into the cutscene idly. In this state, Banjo does not respond to input. If the player jumps back into the cauldron after the cutscene, the game will progress as normal. But if they don't re-enter the cauldron though, Banjo will continue to spawn into future cutscenes, such as when a level is opening. If the player uses the menu to exit the game though, they will regain analog control of Banjo at the end of the cutscene. This can be used to navigate into levels during the opening cutscene, skipping any layer movement that level requires. Cutscene warping can also be used to clone notes. The way the game stores notes is activated through pressing the level exit pad. When pressed, the game will record the number of notes Banjo collected in the level and give that amount back to him upon re-entry. If an exit pad is not pressed, the game will not take the notes from Banjo and instead allow him to bring them into a new world. The issue is exiting the level without using a pad. This is where cutscene warping and pause overlap glitch comes into play. When a witch switch is pressed, it'll trigger a cutscene in the hub world. While Banjo's in a cutscene warping state, he'll also spawn in. With proper timing, the player can use pause overlap glitch to exit the game, giving them control of Banjo again and navigating to a load trigger. This will spawn Banjo in the room that he entered, quitting whichever level he was in without pressing the level exit pad. This allows the player to clone the notes they collected in that level, carrying them into a new level and even repeat the glitch to clone them again. What used to require collecting 810 notes has been whittled down to only a few hundred of the fastest. This cut nearly 20 minutes off of the old route, while obsoleting the run's previous defining trick, completely changing the game by simply pausing it. If you made it this far and enjoyed the video, take a pause to consider subscribing to the channel and liking the video. With all the time that goes into making them, it means a lot to see people enjoying the videos. At first glance, pausing a game or messing with menus doesn't seem very fast for a speedrun. As it turns out though, they frequently end up being among the most game-breaking aspects. While developers spend months and years polishing the movement, mechanics, and feel of a game, much less attention is paid to a feature that interrupts this experience. This allows glitches to slip through the cracks, creating some of the most unique and game-breaking tricks in all of speedrunning, all with the pause of a button. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.